so much for that introduction. Congratulations on the Crab Church Festival and um, my thanks for inviting me down here uh, to speak. Um, now, as you've just heard, the Levellers were um, a movement which emerged during the course of the English Revolution, formulated um, one of the first ever proposals for uh, a democratic state in the Agreement of the People, three editions, the first in, 16, uh, in 1647 and uh, galvanised a, a mass movement, um, the techniques of which really are still alive in protest movements today, of radical pamphleteering, of radical petitioning, of mass demonstrations. And their leader, John Lilburn, uh, was one of the best known political figures uh, in the entirety of the English Revolution. But I'm not going to try and condense the entire history of the Levellers uh, into half an hour uh, tonight, and I thought that perhaps what I ought to do, um, especially as Professor Hutton is speaking about uh, Prince Rupert later on, is to do something a little bit, a little bit different. And that what I would do um, was to talk about those occasions on which uh, John Lilburn and some other levellers um, came face to face with Prince Rupert. So this is going to be a kind of um, when. Uh, Honest John Lilburn met uh, Prince Plunder, as he was uh, sometimes uh, sometimes called uh, in the English Revolution, at least by um, his opponents. And in the course of doing that, um, I hope that I'll be able to give you some sense of what it was that produced the Leveller movement, what experiences the people who founded the Leveller movement in 1646-47 uh, what it was that they'd gone through, what it was that they'd experienced, um, how they defined themselves uh, in the course of the English uh, Civil War. So the first um, point, I guess, that uh, we could talk about this is the first major battle of the English Revolution at Edge Hill in uh, 1642. This was the first time in which the mass of the par parliamentarian army met the mass of the Royalist Army. And John Lilburn um, fought at Edge Hill. He was uh, a captain in Lord Robert Brooks' regiment of Purple Coats, and he fought bravely, as it was later recorded by the London Militia Committee, at Kenton or Kyneton Fight, as Edge Hill was more frequently referred to then. Um, he wasn't the only uh, future leveller to be fighting at Edge Hill very interesting character called um, later Colonel uh, William Ayres uh, fought there as well. William Ayres um, turns up in practically every, every major confrontation uh, between the Leveller movement and their opponents in the course of the English uh, Revolution. He um, had land in Berkshire um, adjacent to um, the land held by the MP um, Henry Martin. Now Henry Martin um, was um, probably the only um, convinced Republican uh, in the Long Parliament when it opened in 1640. He was uh, a regicide, he signed uh, the King's uh, death warrant in 1649, and Henry Martin and William Ayres were uh, very close uh, comrades in arms. When, um, when uh, um, Martin raised a kind of leveller regiment um, Colonel Ayres um, was his uh, fellow organiser of, uh, of that regiment. When the Leffler um, forces in the army uh, mutinied against the, the high command at the Ware Rendezvous in 1647, uh, Colonel William Ayres was one of the people leading it and one of the people arrested and jailed uh, because of it. Um, in the Burford uh, mutiny, um, which was the, the kind of almost but not quite the last stand of the of the Leveller movement after the execution of the King and the coming to power of Cromwell and the group around him. Um, William Ayres uh, was the last man standing, or the last man fighting at any rate in, uh, in Burford during the uh, Burford mutiny. But anyway, he was there um, at, uh, at Edge Hill, he, Ayres this is, Ayres was there at Edge Hill, he was um, a sergeant in uh, Denzel Hollis's uh, Redcoats, and when a section of that regiment lost its officers, Ayres rallied them on the field and took them back into the 
uh, back in uh, to the fight. Um, the moment of contact uh, between um, the um, forces, the cavalry led by Prince Rupert and, well, not actually John Lilburn, probably. Uh, if there was any direct contact at all, it would have been not with John, but with his wife, Elizabeth Lilburn, who was a formidable uh, political activist in her own right. She had come to war with John Lilburn. She was with the baggage train um, at Edge Hill, and uh, Rupert's cavalry charge ended, as it sometimes did, in the plundering of the baggage, uh, the baggage train in which the Lilburns um, lost all their belongings. So I think we have to say that probably the first meeting of Rupert and the Lilburns um, didn't leave a good impression on the Lilburns. Um, they were to meet again in what was the subsequent uh, and um, second major confrontation between the armies um, when um, the king came probably as close as he ever did um, to regaining um, the capital, to regaining London. Uh, and that was the Battle of Brentford in early November 1642. The Edge Hill confrontation had been um, a confrontation in which both sides claimed victory, but in fact probably neither had it. Um, but what it certainly did do is it allowed the Royalist forces to move towards and threaten, uh, and threaten London. Again, both William Ayres and John Lil Lilburn were in the fight at uh, Brentford. Um, actually... It was uh, the merest stroke of luck that Lilburn was there because um, his valour at Edge Hill had um, got the London Militia Committee uh, to the point where they were just about to give him a commission to raise uh, a, a company of horse himself. Um, Lord Brooke, his commander, had to intervene with him directly on the eve of battle and accuse him of being covetous for wanting to have a company of horse himself and being a coward for deserting on the moment uh, before uh, the imminent confrontation with the king's forces. Now these were two accusations which were absolutely guaranteed uh, to get Lilburn to do um, what Lord Brooke wanted him to do, to accuse him of being both a coward and of really wanting his own company for money um, were the two things which would have absolutely gone to the centre of Lilburn's character because whatever else you thought of him, he was certainly a highly moral character and a completely <coughs> brave one. And so he gave up the company, rode that night out to Brentford on the west of London and joined um, the, uh, his existing regiment, Lord Brooke's, uh, purple coats. Ayres was there. He was in the forlorn hope. He was in the skirmishing line of um, of the uh, of Denzel Hollis's red coats, who got badly mauled at Edge Hill and uh, were right at the front of the battle line in Brentford um, when this happened um, on the 11th of uh, November, the night of the 11th of November. There was a, a heavy mist. Um, Rupert took the cavalry uh, ahead of the King's army and ran straight at Burford. He will have run straight in uh, to Colonel William Ayres' forlorn hope, who fell back on Brentford. Uh, then he, he fell on the rest of uh, Denzel Hollis's uh, redcoats and badly uh, pushed them back. Um, Lilburn then arrived on the field with um, the, um, uh, a chunk of, a part of, a section of, um, uh, Robert Brooks um, purple coats. They had very, in very similar conditions to um, uh, the red coats at Edge Hill, had lost their officers, and they were just about, well, they were in fact um, turning round and running back towards, uh, back towards uh, London. Lilburn recorded a little bit later. I galloped after them and put them to a stand. At the head of whom I made the best encouraging speech I could and took those colours that were mine into my own hands and desired all those that had spirits of men, the gallantry of soldiers, and would willingly and resolutely spend their blood for their country to preserve the honour that they had lately gained at Kenton Battle and to follow me, which they did. They followed him back into the, the battle. Uh, Lilburn had a, 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 an incredible battle where he was... Uh, many, of the people, many of the parliamentarians were pushed back into the river. Many of them lost their lives uh, through drowning. This happened to Lilburn on a number of, uh, a number of occasions, um, but he, uh, he survived um, and uh, was then captured uh, by the king's uh, forces 
and taken to the king's capital then in Oxford. So I think we have to say that the, the second meeting of Rupert and uh, uh, John Lilburn really uh, didn't go any better for John Lilburn, possibly considerably worse than the first meeting at, um, at Edge Hill. Um, so, uh, John Lilburn is now prisoner in Oxford Castle and he's been put on trial for his life um, by the king. Um, there are several charges against him, we'll come to those uh, in a moment, but he was held in, um, he'd been in prison before by Charles in the, in the 1630s for uh, in, importing radical religious uh, pamphlets. Um, at that time he'd been held in uh, very barbarous uh, conditions in the, in the fleet uh, prison. He'd been um, whipped, um, he'd been tied to the back of a cart and as part of his punishment the cart dragged him from the fleet prison where Fleet Street ends now in London um, to New Palace Yard in Westminster and every step of the way he was um, whipped uh, with a knotted leather uh, whip. It's reckoned that he had about uh, 500 lashes and the eyewitnesses, the crowds that were generally supportive of him, said that his shoulders uh, were swelled like penny loaves. Um, that imprisonment was harsh. The imprisonment in Oxford um, was at least as harsh. Um, he was held in uh, leg and <coughs> neck irons. Uh, he was often uh, deprived, uh, deprived of food. Uh, he became so ill that all his uh, hair um, fell out uh, during the, the process of his uh, imprisonment. He had um, some uh, support there. After the Battle of Marlborough, uh, the prisoners from the Royalist prisoners, parliamentarians taken prisoners by the Royalists, um, were brought to Oxford Jail as well, and amongst them um, was uh, Francis Freeman, who was a notorious um, radical, later to become uh, a ranter, was uh, a, a fellow prisoner of Lilburn's. Um, Lilburn, as he always seemed uh, to be able to do, no matter how uh, close uh, the imprisonment, um, could nearly on all occasions in his life um, smuggle out written material and have it printed uh, by his supporters. And the mere fact that he was in the king's capital, uh, way behind enemy lines, didn't stop him doing this either. Um, there was a parliamentarian spy a man called Robinson, I think probably later, probably the same person who was later was employed uh, by, the parliament, by the parliamentarians as a, a, as a, as a, a spy, um, smuggled out Lilburn's letters, got them to London. They were printed by Lilburn's, uh, Lilburn's friends in, uh, in London. Um, he was approached, uh, he, he, got, he was already a, a significant political figure, and he, uh, he got rather better treatment than Francis Freeman and the others who were also held in, in irons, uh, dragged out to the courtyard of Oxford jail, uh, jail berated um, by um, royalist uh, uh, luminaries who tried to get them to, send, to sign the, the royalist uh, Wiltshire protestation. Um, uh, they refused and were, were punished uh, for refusing. Some of this happened to Lilburn as well, but he also got a rather kind of more VIP treatment, um, at least in terms of attempting to get him to turn his coat. Um, no less than uh, four royalist lords approached him and in a mixture of um, bribery and threats uh, tried to get him to turn his coat and uh, join the, uh, the royalists. Um, if they thought it was going to be a short conversation, they didn't really know Lilburn. Um, he detained them for an hour <coughs> explaining uh, why they had absolutely no grounds uh, to try him uh, at all. Uh, they said, well, you were one of the leaders of the demonstrations that uh, drew uh, mobs to, to Westminster and drove the king out of London in the first place. We're going to try you for that. He said, well, you can't really do that because I've already been on trial for that and I was acquitted um, under the king. And so you can't do that. Um, so uh, they, they tried another couple of tacks and, uh, and they said, no, I'm sorry, whatever you say, we're still going to try you. Uh, for, uh, uh, for treason. You've taken up arms against the king. He said, no, I've only taken up arms against the king's evil counsellors, but not surprisingly that didn't wash, uh, and he was um, dragged, off, uh, dragged off to court. And um, in court, um, he was cross-examined by uh, Lord Northampton and some others, and among the others was Prince Rupert himself. Now, I always arrive at this moment, and I think, you know, if you were to read this in a historical novel, you know, if this was a fiction, you 
begin to wonder, did, is it really true that the future leader of the Levellers, probably the most radical political figure in London, actually did come face to face um, with uh, the most cavalier of the cavaliers? Is that actually what happened? But it did. And there's a magnificent pamphlet, which, does, which just is very short, but it just lays out like a play, the discussion uh, between the two of them. So um, since there's a bit of theatrics in the evening already, I'll... Um, I'll just uh, give you some account of, um, of what, was, what was said between them, if I can find the appropriate place. So it goes like this. Um, the uh, Lord, Lord Northampton and Lord Rivers and Prince Rupert are cross-examining uh, Lilburn. And uh, Northampton demanded of Lil if, um, if Lilburn's conscience, conscience had convinced him of... Uh, the crime that he could, stood condemned of in law. So Lilburn asked him by return whether the abuse of the law had convicted their conscience. So at this point, Rupert himself interrupts and asks um, uh, whether, um, the, um, whether he would like to choose um, what death he was to face being a soldier. So Lilburn replied to Rupert that uh, he would uh, like to have a sword, please, uh, and that he would um, die in single combat with any one of them, or any two of them, if they so chose, so that he could die as a soldier, which was possibly a risky <laughs> legal strategy with Rupert, but we don't, we don't know, because um, at this point, um, Rupert then ignored this, um, seems to be one of the rare moments when Rupert ignored a military advantage, but anyway he did, uh, and said uh, to Lilburn um, whether he were convinced that it was lawful to shed innocent blood by the abuse of the law. And Lilburn replied to him asking him if he thought it was lawful to, sell, to shed innocent blood uh, by the abuse of the law. Clearly uh, this was going nowhere and uh, the Royalist Lords concluded by saying um, the fellow is mad and sending him back to jail. Now, um, you know, there's, there's a humorous element to this, but not if you were Lilburn at the time. This was going to end very, very quickly um, in, his, uh, in his death, in his execution by the Royalists in Oxford. The thing that saved him um, was appeals to his supporters in the House of Commons. Um, his wife, Elizabeth Lilburn, um, was at the bar of the House of Commons constantly lobbying on his behalf. In one of the pamphlets that he already had written and printed, he'd appealed to, the, uh, uh, to Essex, to uh, Earl of Essex, uh, the parliamentarian commander, to arrange a prisoner exchange for him. And in actual fact, um, the Commons did vote um, that if Lilburn were executed, they would then execute every royalist prisoner they had in their command, and they would continue to execute any that they caught afterwards. Now, uh, this was uh, enough to do the trick, but it was only two days uh, from Lilburn's execution, and this message had to get from the Commons to Oxford. And Elizabeth Lilburn, uh, despite the fact that she was heavily pregnant at the time, took to the road, did what very few people at that time had done, got through both uh, enemy and uh, friendly checkpoints, got to Oxford and arranged for this message to be delivered and was responsible, um, therefore, for Lilburn's eventual, uh, eventual <coughs> release. So I think we can say um, that the first three encounters uh, now at Edge Hill, at Brentford, and in Oxford Jail between John Lilburn and Prince Rupert really weren't doing anything, shall we say, to negotiate an end to hostilities uh, in general or probably in particular. Um, so I just want to move on... Um, 15 minutes down. So I want to move on now to... Um, because if you, you, you can see, you know, I think we sometimes are a little glib about um, how people became as radical as they were, how they became, for instance, convinced... Um, that the only solution to this political crisis in 1649 um, was to put their own king on trial uh, for treason and to execute him as a consequence. But I think when you look at just Lilburn's experience, 
and his experience wasn't a unique experience, it was an experience which you know, uh, tens of thousands at least of, uh, of people in England were, were going through. Um, it was an experience which uh, the entire population uh, was experiencing in one way or another. For instance, at the time that the king was approaching London, was in the time of the Battle of Brentford and the, the, the subsequent day, called the Battle of Turnham Green, although there was very little fighting on the day when the entirety of London and the, the trained bands turned out in such numbers that the king retreated from, from, from London, even though they'd had a victory the previous day at, uh, at Brentford. Um, the fear was on that population. The fear of uh, a, a hostile army led by the royalists plundering, uh, plundering the city produced an absolutely huge uh, mobilisation, 24,000 uh, Londoners um, out in array at, uh, at Turnham Green, and so those kind that intensity of, of experience, and um, this was something that Lilburn relied on for his whole political career. That something that he had personally experienced was in some way emblematic, uh, symbolic of what thousands or perhaps hundreds of thousands of people um, were experiencing in one way or another. Now, not all of them, of course, reacted as Lilburn did. But significant numbers of them reacted in this way, and that was what provided the kind of base for the Leveller, uh, for the Leveller movement. But to, to move on a little bit further now, um, both William Ayres um, and John Lilburn, after um, Lilburn, after he was released from Oxford, um, Ayres, because he was part of Hollis's uh, regiment, which basically um, got destroyed at uh, first. Edge Hill and then at, uh, at Brentford. It never appears on the, the parliamentary muster list um, after, that, after that time. Both of them, Lilburn and Ayres, were consciously recruited by Oliver Cromwell into the Eastern Association, um, where Cromwell was building uh, an entirely uh, different kind of army, or significantly different kind of army. Um, Ayres uh, was himself, uh, I think, the captain of the 6th Troop, of uh, Cromwell's Ironsides, uh, eventually a double, uh, a, a double regiment, um, recruited, as many of you will probably know, uh, on the principle uh, that the war was going to be fought to the finish. You know, there was essentially within the parliamentary camp and after Brentford, two views of what would happen in the war. Either the war was a kind of armed negotiation in which you put enough pressure militarily on the king to agree a settlement that uh, Parliament could accept and be returned to the throne, or there was going to be uh, a war fought uh, with sufficient ferocity that the King could at best negotiate from a position of defeat and weakness, and possibly not being too much negotiation at all. Well, that was really a conclusion that came, uh, came um, a, little bit, a, bit, a little bit later. So, Ayres is in the Ironsides. Um, Lilburn isn't in the Ironsides. He's uh, in uh, a dragoon, uh, a dragoon regiment, which is uh, in Lincolnshire under a Colonel King. Although he's placed there um, as a political agent, really, by Cromwell, because Cromwell, uh, although he thinks the Colonel King is a Lincolnshire man who has support in the county, he doesn't trust him. He's a Presbyterian. He's part of the more moderate kind of peace party. Um, and he places Lilburn in his regiment as a political agent to report on what King is doing uh, and to uh, carry out the kind of more radical vision of what should happen um, that Cromwell is supporting at this time. And um, this is the point, the next point at which um, John Lilburn and Prince Rupert um, meet each other on the battlefield in 1644. Um, Sir John Meldrum is besieging the Royalists in Newark. Um, Prince Rupert arrives with a force to lift uh, the siege, to drive off the parliamentarian, the parliamentarian besiegers, um, and uh, Lilburn is in that, uh, in that fight, and he's one of the few people actually in that fight who can claim that he had a military victory over uh, Prince Rupert. Uh, one report of the battle says that Prince Rupert um, with a great body of horse came unexpectedly on Parliament's forces before Newark, so that they had no time to prepare or receive him. Yet Colonel Rossiter, Major Lilburn, Captain Bethel and Hunt gallantly charged and routed the right wing, led by the Prince. Unfortunately, 
the rest of the parliamentary uh, forces weren't doing so well. 500 of them ran away, and Rupert um, had, the, had the day. But probably um, the most significant thing about this is not the military engagement, but the politics that came afterwards. Um, Colonel King, according to Lilburn and many others, had a divided officer corps, politically divided officer corps, um, had run away during the battle, had agreed a surrender of, uh, of the uh, parliamentarian forces so long as they surrendered their arms, and then ordered uh, the parliamentarian forces, including Lilburn, um, uh, including Lilburn's regiment, to ride away with their arms. Uh, because they'd broken the conditions of the surrender, uh, they were attacked by the royalist forces and completely stripped of everything they had, so that Lilburn, uh, as he recorded himself, he said, after King, Colonel King shifted for himself, i.e. ran off, um, Lilburn's forces were plundered, and Lilburn personally had to make his way over a hedge and ditch, stripped of everything he had, horse, bag, papers, hat, doublet, boots, and even the periwig he'd been wearing to cover the fact that his hair still hadn't grown back after his illness in Oxford jail. So I think we can say this was another occasion which was building up resentment, to say the, to say the least. Um, but resentment actually mainly aimed at Colonel King. So this was the beginning, or, or one of the beginnings, of the huge debate inside Cromwell's Eastern Association about the course of the war. And Lilburn had one final uh, uh, element to play in this, which made him a, a, a quite a big figure in this oncoming argument, because the commander of the Eastern Association was the Earl of Manchester, who had peace party, Presbyterian, moderate leanings, and Cromwell, who was his lieutenant general, in the uh, association. Lilburn fought at Marston Moor in 1644, one of the two decisive battles along with Naseby at the end of the, uh, of the war. And after the, uh, the Royalists were beaten at Marston Moor, there was a huge debate about whether Manchester's forces, whether the Eastern Association should move quickly to follow up on their victory and begin smashing up the Royalist forces, or whether they were not going to move this quickly at all. Um, there was an engagement which Cromwell had sent uh, Lilburn on to besiege Tickhill Castle on the borders of Yorkshire and Northamptonshire. It was a minor military engagement. Um, Lilburn sent a troop of uh, his dragoons across the drawbridge, occupied the area between the bridge and the town in a night manoeuvre, seized the mill, broke open the mill dam. I don't think the Royalists were, had much heart uh, for a fight. They offered to surrender. In fact, they offered to meet uh, Lilburn in a, uh, a tavern nearby and be merry, which he did. And while they were being merry, they offered to surrender as long as there was a summons for them to um, relieve, uh, to give up the castle. Uh, Lilburn was pretty excited about this. He'd got a surrender of a sort of significant fortress. He goes to see Manchester, uh, the Earl of Manchester, and Manchester goes berserk at him and says, what do you mean? You don't understand what it means to summon a castle. You're an idiot. You're a rogue. You're a rascal. Um, this is a terrible mistake. I won't commit ten men to it. What happens if it turns into a long siege? Um, I could lose the credibility of the whole army. Uh, you're not doing it. So Lilburn starts arguing with him and says, well, uh, you know, uh, why don't you just wink at me, he says. And I can just go and take the castle and you don't have to commit the whole army uh, to this. And uh, to this proposal, um, uh, Manchester says, um, uh, get thee gone, ye mad fellow. Now, Lilburn, I have to say at this point, stretch on his own, um, which he does, and gains its surrender, and comes back to Manchester with the Royalist commanders in tow, and Manchester goes berserk for a, a second time, threatening to hang uh, Lilburn and uh, to uh, deprive him of his commission and so forth and so on. Now, this microcosm, this is a microcosm of the politics that's going on in the Eastern, Eastern Association and it explodes very, very quickly uh, because Cromwell launches an attack on Manchester for his uh, dilatory military proceedings, his inability to mobilise the Eastern Association for his unwillingness to prosecute um, a victory. Um, it's made all the worse because um, Manchester then writes to the Committee of Both Kingdoms, which is the kind of political executive at this point, claiming that 
he took Tick to, to Kill Castle, and it was all his doing that did it, adding to the, the, the long history of senior officers claiming uh, the credit for something which their subordinates have actually done. But as I say, this is a microcosm of what's going on inside the parliamentary army and inside the most advanced section of the parliamentary army at this point. And Cromwell launches an attack in the Commons uh, on, uh, on Manchester. He cites the whole incident in, uh, of Tickle Castle as a, particular, uh, as a particular example. And we can condense this whole debate, which was a sort of uh, you know, shattering political debate inside the parliamentarian uh, forces. It results actually in the self-denying ordinance and the, the establishment of the new model army in the following year, but we can, we can reduce this whole debate to an exchange uh, between uh, the Earl of Manchester and Oliver Cromwell. And Manchester um, said this, uh, if we beat the king 99 times, he would be the king still and his posterity and we subjects still. But if he beat us but once, we shall all be hanged. And Cromwell replied to this, um, if this be true, it is against fighting hereafter. In other words, we cannot have a military policy which is based on constantly allowing the king to stand up again so he's strong enough to negotiate a peace with us. We have to fight the war to the finish. And that was the big dividing line. But around it, um, the people who most wanted to do this, who most wanted to support Cromwell, were the most radical people in the army. Radical religious people, radical political people, people who were going to become the heart of the independent party and of the leveller party uh, in the future. And it is that experience, both of the conflict with the royalists and the conflict among their own supporters about how it was best to confront the royalists, which radicalised a whole section of the people involved in the English Revolution, created the conditions in which the leveller party in 16. 46, 1647, 1648, 1649, could constantly mobilise, even against Cromwell when he was negotiating with the king, but constantly mobilise for the most radical, the most thoroughgoing, the most deep-seated, and the most democratic uh, solutions to the problems which faced Parliament in its conflict with the Royalists.